so everyone can hear, yes? I can hear anyway. Good. Well, I want to thank Mandala Books, Jan. I want to thank Jay Widener for bringing me back to Seattle, the home of real grunge and to real peculiarity. Uh, before I plunge into this, I should tell you, because Harper would like me to, that uh, the invisible landscape, after years and years of being out of print, will is shipping right now. I don't know if it's in the bookstores, but it's it's real. And uh, True Hallucinations is going into paper at the same time. So if you were couldn't afford the 22, wait for the 12. <laughs> or the 2012. <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about tonight, simply because it's the thing that is moving me to the edge of my chair at the moment, is uh, I called the talk Eros and the Eschaton. And what I could have called it is Eros and the Eschaton, what science forgot. Because somebody asked me recently, um, is there any permission to hope? More specifically, is there any permission for smart people to hope? I mean, it's easy to hope if you're stupid, but uh, <clears throat> is there any basis for intelligent people to hope? And I, I wanted to deal with that because uh, I, I think so. I mean, it was to me a shocking question because I, I live in an aura of hope because I live in a twilight world of my own self-generated, cannabinated fantasy. <laughs> and I forget that not everyone is so fortunate and, and that there's a lot of, uh, of despair and uncertainty out there. So I wanted to talk about this. I'll talk for a while, and then we'll break and... Uh, have an intermission. I'll sign books if anybody needs a book signed, and then we'll come back and do Q and A on this till uh, till we're sick of it, basically. Yeah, and if there's a technician adjusting this, help me out a little bit. Um, Eros and the eschaton, these are the two uh, areas that I think compromise the old paradigm and give permission to hope. And strangely, neither of these words is that well known, which gives you a measure of how completely the dominator position has uh, squelched, subverted, and, uh, and downplayed any opposition to its worldview. Eros, we know about in some kind of devalued, sticky kind of glitzy way because we get it in the eroticization of media and society. But really what eros means in, uh, in the Greek sense is a kind of unity of nature, a kind of all-pervasive order that bridges one ontological level to another. This is not permitted in the official worldview of our civilization, which is science. Uh, the, the world of inorganic chemistry is not thought to make any statement about the organic world, and the organic world is not thought to be extrapolatable into the world of culture and, uh, and thought. There are imagined to be clear breaks in these categories. I, I had a biologist tell me once, if genes aren't involved, it ain't evolution. So that means you can't talk about the evolution of the earth as a physical body. You can't talk about the evolution of human social institutions. Evolution is somehow a word uh, appropriate to biology and appropriate nowhere else. And this brings me then to the first uh, factor 
easily discerned by anybody who has their eyes open that compromises and erodes the hopeless existential view of the world that we're getting from science. And that is the idea that nature is in fact across all scales and all levels of phenomena a unity. It's not a coincidence that electrons spinning around an atomic nucleus and planets going around a star and star clusters orbiting around the gravitational center of a galaxy, it's no coincidence that these uh, systems exhibit the same kind of order on different scales. And yet science would say that is a coincidence. You know, P.W. Bridgman, who was a philosopher of science, defined a coincidence as what you have left over when you apply a bad theory. It means that, you know, you've overlooked something and what jumps out at you as a coincidence is actually a set of relationships whose, uh, whose causuistry is sim whose relationships to each other are simply hidden from you. And what I've observed, and I think it is fair to give credit to the psychedelic experience for this, what I've observed is that nature builds on previously established levels of complexity. This is a great general natural law that your own senses will confirm for you, but that has never been allowed into the canon of science. And what I mean by that nature builds on complexity is the following. When the universe was born in the dubious and controversial circumstance called the Big Bang, it was at first simply a pure plasma of electrons. It was the simplest that it could possibly be. There were no atoms, there were no molecules, there were no highly organized systems of any kind. There was simply a pure plasma of expanding energy. And as the universe cooled, simply cooled, new kinds of phenomena, we say, emerged out of the situation. Uh, as the universe cooled, atomic nuclei could form and electrons could settle into stable orbits. As the universe further cooled, the chemical bond became a possibility. Still later, the hydrogen bond, which is a weaker bond, which is the basis of biology. So as the universe aged, it complexified. This is so obvious that it's never really been challenged, but on the other hand, it's never been uh, embraced as a general and dependable principle either. Follow it through with me. Out of atomic systems come chemical systems. Out of chemical systems comes the covalent hydrogen bond, the carbon bond, complex chemistry that is prebiotic or organic. Out of that chemistry come the macrophysical systems that we call membranes, gels, charge transfer complexes, this sort of thing. These systems are the chemical uh, preconditions for life, simple life, the life of the prokaryotes, the life of naked, unnucleated DNA that characterized primitive life on the planet. Out of that life come 
eukaryotes, nucleated cells, and then complex colonies of cells, and then cell specialization, leading to higher animals, leading to social animals, leading to complex social systems, leading to technologies, leading to globe-girdling, electronically-based, information-transfer-oriented cultures like ourselves. Someone said, what, what's so progressive about media? It's the spreading of darkness at the speed of light. It, it can be. It can be. Well, so this is very interesting, that apparently the way the universe works is upon a, com, upon a platform of previously achieved complexity – chemical, electrical, social, biological, whatever, new forms of complexity can be built that cross these ontological boundaries. In other words, what I mean by that is that biology is based on complex chemistry, but it is more than complex chemistry. Social systems are based on the organization that is animal life, and yet it is more than animal life. So this is a general law of the universe overlooked by science, that out of complexity emerges greater complexity. We could almost say that the universe, nature, is a novelty-conserving or complexity-conserving engine. It makes complexity, and it preserves it, and it uses it as the basis for further complexity. Now, there's more to this than simply that. I think we all observationally could agree with what has been said so far. The added wrinkle, or an added wrinkle, is that each advancement into complexity, into novelty, proceeds more quickly than the stage that preceded it. This is very profound because it, if accepted as a serious first principle, it ends the marginalization of our own species to speak to the level of spectator status in a universe that knows nothing of us and cares nothing for us. This is the most advanced uh, position that modern science will allow us. Spectators to a drama we didn't write, shouldn't expect to understand, and cannot influence. But I say, if in fact novelty is the name of the game, if in fact the conservation and complexification of novelty is what the universe is striving for, then suddenly our own human enterprise, previously marginalized, takes on an immense new importance. We are apparently players in the cosmic drama, and in this particular act of the cosmic drama, we hold a very central role. We are at the uh, pinnacle of the, complex, of the expression of complexification in the animal world, and somehow this complexity which is concentrated in us has flowed over out of the domain of animal organization and into this mysterious domain which we call culture, language, consciousness, higher values. Each stage of advancement into complexity occurs more quickly than the stage which preceded it. After the initial Big Bang, there was a period of billions of years when the universe cooled, stars condensed, planetary systems formed, and then the quickening process crossed an invisible Rubicon into the domain of animal and biological organization. 
Well, you see, since the since uh, the rise of Western monotheism. The human experience has been marginalized. We have been told that we were unimportant in the cosmic drama. But we now know from the feedback that we're getting from the impact of human culture on the earth that we are a major factor shaping the temperatures of the oceans, the composition of the atmosphere, the general speed and complexity of speciation on the planet, so forth and so on. A single species, ourselves, has broken from the ordinary constraints of animal nature and created a new world, an epigenetic world, meaning a world not based on gene transfer and chemical uh, propagation and preservation of information, but a world based on ideas, on symbols, on technologies, on tools, on ideas downloaded out of the human imagination and concretized in three-dimensional space as choppers, arrow points, particle accelerators, gene sequencers, uh, spacecraft, what have you. All of this uh, complexification occurring at a faster and faster rate. And this brings me then to the second uh, quality or phenomena that science has overlooked, which is the acceleration of complexification, that the early history of the universe proceeded with excruciating slowness. Then life took hold in the oceans of this planet, a quickening of process and evolution. But still, things proceeded on a scale of tens of millions of years to clock major change. Then, the conquest of the land, higher animals, higher exposure to radiation, faster change, species following species, one upon another. Then, uh, 50,000, 100,000, a million years ago, anyway, recently, the crossover into the domain of culture, tool making, myth making, dance, poetry, song, story, uh, and that set the stage for the, the fall into history. The incredibly unusual and self-consuming process that has been going on for the past 15 or 20,000 years. A biological snap of the finger. And yet, in that time, everything that we call human, everything that we associate with higher values, has been adumbrated, elaborated, created, set in place by one species, ourselves. This acceleration of time or complexity shows no sign of slowing down. In fact, within the fabric of our own lives, we can almost daily, hourly, by the minute, feel it speeding up, taking hold. It's a cliche that time is moving faster and faster, a cliche of the mass media. But I want to suggest that this is not uh, a perceptual illusion or a cultural mirage that this is actually happening to the space-time matrix, that time is in fact speeding up, that history in which we are embedded because our life of 50 to 80 years is so ephemeral on a scale of 10 to 15,000 years. But nevertheless, history is a state of incredible destabilization. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a chaostrophe in the process of happening. It begins with animals kept in balance by natural selection, and it ends with a global 
internet of electronic information transfer and a language using species hurling its instruments toward the stars, there is no reason for us to suppose that this process of acceleration is ever going to slow down or be deflected. It has been a law of nature from the very beginning of nature that this acceleration was built in. What poses a problem to us as thinking individuals is that the speed of involution toward concrescence is now so great that we can feel the tug of it within the confines of our own lives. There has been more change since 1960 than in the previous several thousand years. There has been more change since 1992 than in the previous thousand years. Change is accelerating. Invention, connection, adumbration of ideas, mathematical algorithms, connectivity of people, social systems. This is all accelerating furiously and under the control of no one Not the Catholic Church, the Communist Party, the IMF. uh, uh, No one is in charge of this process. This is what makes history so interesting. It's a runaway freight train on a dark and stormy night. This is why I'm not particularly sympathetic to uh, conspiracy theory. Because I can't make the leap to faith that would cause you to believe anyone could get hold of the beast enough to control it. I mean, conspiracies, of course, we have conspiracies up the kazoo, but none of them are succeeding. They're all being swept away, compromised, astonished by new information, and endlessly agonized. So, two factors relating to Eros. The uh, the movement into complexity and the fact that that movement goes ever faster. And the second quality, the acceleration of the movement into novelty, leads me to the third point, which uh, is, I suppose, more controversial. And I am frankly willing to admit that my sensitivity to this third point is based on um, my psychedelic experience. I mean, science is the exploration of the experience of nature without psychedelics. And I propose, therefore, to expand that enterprise and say we need a science beyond science. We need a science which plays with a full deck. And the reason the psychedelic experience is so important here is not not some namby-pamby notion that it expands consciousness or it makes you more perceptive or something like that. I mean, that is all true, but it isn't strongly enough put A cultural point of view is like uh, a crystal. You have an amorphous cultural medium which at certain temperatures will form a crystal of cultural convention, if you will. And within the geometry of that crystal, certain things make sense and certain things are excluded from making sense. Science is a a condensed cultural point of view that is a rigid crystal of interlocking assumptions, assumptions such as matter is primary, mind is tertiary, causality works from the past into the future, so forth and so on. What psychedelics do in terms of their impact on the physical brain and organism of human beings is they withdraw cultural programming. They dissolve cultural assumptions. They lift you out of that reassuring crystalline matrix of interlocking truths which are lies. 
and instead they throw you into the presence of the great who knows the mystery the mystery that has been banished from western thought since the rise of christianity and the suppression of the mystery religions now the the model that attracts me to the psychedelic experience is not that it makes you smarter a kind of simple minded idea paradoxically or the idea that <laughs> you are paying attention right? <laughs> or the idea that it's some kind of magnifying glass into the personal unconscious your trauma your childhood memories uh, the satanic abuse your parents laid on you so forth and so on the the model which i like is a geometric model and says simply that since the rise of the greek alphabet print linear thinking and science we have become imprisoned in a causal universe of material connectivity and that this is a cultural myth as much as believing that we are the sons and daughters of of uh, the great father who got out of his canoe at the second waterfall to take a leak i mean these are just cultural myths uh what is revealed through the psychedelic experience i think is a higher dimensional perspective on reality and i use higher dimensional in the mathematical sense literally you are lifted out of the plane of cultural assumptions and can look down with the kind of godlike understanding that one obtains when one flies in an airplane over a landscape previously only viewed from the ground in other words from the vantage point of the psychedelic experience the cultural landscape is seen more nearly in its correct perspective seen as historically bounded spatially and intellectually bounded now it's no coincidence that if you analyze biology what it is it's a kind of conquest of dimensionality the earliest forms of life were probably slimes of some sort stabilized on a clay surface immobile unable to perceive light with no sense of time merely a, a, a fingernail or a toe hold in existence and then if you look at the entire fossil record what you see is the evolution of senses of sensory perceptors and organs of locomotion the perceptors the eye the hand bring into the cognitive field the sense of things at a distance and then language provides models for these things at a distance similarly fins legs so forth means of locomotion carry us through space this is a journey of dimensionality and essentially what animals are that plants are not are life forms mobile in a very conscious way in the spatial dimension this is why from the point of view of evolutionary biologists animals are somehow more advanced than plants well if conquest of dimensionality is the um criteria then notice that we again occupy a special and privileged position in nature because we can not only run with the best of them see with the best of them but we can remember and anticipate like crazy and other animals are not doing this other animals may imprint past situations of danger or opportunity but they do not analyze experience and extrapolate it toward the hidden domain of the future and 
consciousness is the generalized word that we use for this coordination of complex perception to create a world that draws from the past and builds a, a model of the future and then suspends the perceiving organism in this magical moment called the now where the past is coordinated for the purpose of navigating the future. McLuhan called it driving with the rear view mirror and the only thing good about it is it's better than driving with no mirror at all. All right, now. What this conquest of dimensionality comes to be in the presence of psychedelics is an anticipation of the future. We can anticipate the future. We know to within microseconds when the sun will rise. We know within a few percentage points where the prime rate will be in six months. Some things we can predict fairly closely, some things with less precision. But the perception of the future is very important to us. When we marry the need to perceive the future with the psychedelic experience, I believe we come up with uh, data that is very, very difficult for science to come to terms with. And this is the third item, or, or really the second item in the list, what science forgot. It's what I call the eschaton. Now, eschaton is a rare word uh, until very recently unheard outside schools of theology, which I understand were a dying enterprise. Uh, eschaton comes from the Greek word esk, which just means the end. The eschaton is the last thing, the final thing. And it's very important to science to eliminate from its thinking any suspicion that this eschaton might exist because if it were to exist it would impart to reality a purpose you see if the eschaton exists then it's like a goal or an attraction point or an energy sink toward which historical process is being moved and science is incredibly hostile toward the idea of purpose. If you are not involved in the sciences, this may come as somewhat of a surprise to you. If you are a workbench scientist or a theoretician, you know that this is what's called the problem of teleology. It is because uh, modern science defined itself in the 19th century when the reigning philosophy was deism, and deism was the idea that the universe is a clock made by God, and God wound this clock and has walked away from it, and the clock will eventually run down. That theological construct was poisonous to evolutionary theory in the 19th century. And so they said, we must create a theory of reality that does not require a goal does not require a purpose. Everything must be pushed from the past. Nothing must be pulled toward the future. Uh, the problem with this is that it does not um, fulfill our intuitions about reality. We can see that evolution biological evolution has built on chemical systems. We can see that social and historical systems build on biology. As people with open minds, or as open as they can be inside this culture, we nevertheless have this intuition of purpose. And it is uh, dramatically underscored by the psychedelic experience. 
which takes the raw material of your life, your culture, your history, and tells you this is not an existential mishmash to be lived out with dignity because there's nothing else to be done with it, some kind of Camusian why not affirmation it says no it says you know your your reality is a coherent cosmos and embedded in your own sense of identity embedded in your own sense of purpose is a microscopic reflection of the larger purpose that is built into the universe now, I, I, and uh, this is not just you know blowing smoke in the sense of it's a nice idea or it's like a religious idea like saying Jesus loves you and so feel all right about yourself. It isn't like that. It's, it's a theory about reality that has teeth because reality is actually following the script that this particular version of reality dictates. Reality is accelerating toward an unimaginable omega point. We are the inheritors of immense momentum in our social systems, our philosophical and scientific and technological approaches to the world. Because we're driving the historical vehicle with a rear view mirror, it appears to us that we're headed straight into a brick wall at a thousand miles an hour. It appears that we are destroying the earth, polluting the atmosphere, wrecking the oceans, dehumanizing ourselves, robbing our children of a future, so forth and so on. I believe what is in fact going on is that we are burning our bridges one by one, we're burning our bridges to the past. We cannot go back to the mushroom-dotted plains of Africa or the canopied rainforests of five million years ago. We can't even go back to the era of, of uh, uh, Cayuse and Six Shooter of 200 years ago. We have burned our bridges. We are preparing for a kind of cultural forward escape. And this question, you know, is there cause for optimism? The answer is it depends on where you placed your bets. You know, if you placed your bets on uh, uh, male-dominated institutions based on consumer fetishism, propaganda, classism, and materialism, then God help you, you should call your broker. If... On the other hand, uh, you've recognized that a, a lifeboat strategy is involved here, that what is really important is uh, empowering personal experience, backing off from consumer object fetishism, freeing the mind, empowering the imagination, then in that case, I think you can feel pretty good about what is going on. You know, there's a lot of talk about cultural uh, uh, death and disenfranchisement, and it's usually couched in terms of some happy naked people in the rainforest or in Tajikistan making their rugs or milking their camels or something. And isn't it too bad that their culture is being blown up and traded? in for mall culture and, uh, and uh, shopping by uh, remote, but in fact, all culture is being destroyed. All culture is being uh, sold down the river to the, by the sorts of people who want to turn the entire planet into an international airport arrival concourse. And that's not the victory of somebody's culture over somebody else's culture. Nobody ever had a culture like that. That's just a cul the victory of schlockmeisterism and crapola over good taste and good sense. Well...
If I were um, if I were dependent on the notion that human institutions are necessary to pull us out of the ditch, I would be very despairing. As I said, nobody's in charge. Not the IMF, the Pope, the Communist Party, the Jews. No, no, no. Nobody has their finger on what's going on. So then why hope? Isn't it just a runaway train out of control? I don't think so. I think the out of controlness is the most hopeful thing about it. After all, whose control is it out of? You and I never controlled it in the first place. Why are we anxious about the fact that it's out of control? I think if it's out of control, then our side uh, is winning. To me, the, the, the most confounding datum of the psychedelic experience is this thing which I call the eschaton and I want to talk about it a little bit this evening because I think it is the hardest thing for people to grasp about my particular rap and you know sometimes I've talked to many of you about psychedelic plants shamanism techniques chemistry approaches so forth and so on I, I'm approaching this this evening as a graduate seminar I figure everybody has their little mojo kit and their particular way of approaching these things and then the question is you know what kind of conclusions can we draw and the conclusion I draw is and this is sort of pulling together what I said before we are central to the human drama and to the drama of nature and process on this planet the opposition which is science uh, well first let me say this every every model of the universe has a hard swallow what I mean by a hard swallow is a place where the argument cannot hide the fact that there's something slightly fishy about it the hard swallow built into science is this business about the Big Bang. Now let's give this a little attention here. This is the notion that the universe, for no reason, sprang from nothing in a single instant. Well, now before we dissect this, notion, now, uh, notice that this is the limit test for credulity. Whether you believe this or not, n notice that it is not possible to conceive of something more unlikely or less likely to be believed. I mean, I defy anyone. It's just the limit case for unlikelihood that the universe would spring from nothing in a single instant for no reason. I mean, if you believe that, my family has a bridge across the Hudson River that will give you a lease option for five dollars. Uh, it, it makes no sense. It is, in fact, no different than saying, and God said, let there be light. And what the philosophers of science are saying is, give us one free miracle, and we will roll from that point forward, from the birth of time to the crack of doom, just one free miracle. And then it will all unravel according to natural law and these bizarre equations which nobody can understand but which are so holy in this enterprise. Well, I say then, if science gets one free miracle, then everybody gets one free miracle. And I perceive that it is true when you build these large-scale cosmogonic theories that you have to have a kind of an umbilical cord or a, or a point to start from that is different from all other points in the system. So if we have to have a singularity in our modeling of, of what reality is, let's make it as modest and as non uh, 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 unlikely a 
a singularity as possible. The singularity that arises for no reason in absolutely empty space instantly is the least likely of all singularities. Doesn't it seem more likely, if we have to have a singularity, that it occurs in a domain with a rich history, with many causal streams feeding into the situation that nurtures the complexity. In other words, to put it simply, if you have to have a singularity, doesn't it make more sense to put it at the end of a cosmogonic process than at the beginning? And I think this is the great breakthrough of psychedelics and shamanism, that science got it absolutely wrong. The universe didn't begin in a singularity. Who knows how the universe began or would even presume to judge? But the universe ends in a singularity. It has been growing more singular, more complex, more unique, more novel every passing moment since it burst into existence. And if that's true, then we represent a kind of concrescence of universal intent. We're not mere spectators or a cosmic accident or some sideshow or the Greek chorus to the main event. The human experience is the main event. The coordination of perception, of hope, of dream, of vision that occurs inside the human heart-mind-body interface is the most uh, complex phenomenon in the universe. Now, even the physicalists will agree that the human neocortex represents the most densely ramified matter known to exist in, in the biological world. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that human society, human history, human art, human literature uh, represent things for which there is no analog in the world of wasps, groundhogs, uh, killer whales, and so forth and so on. Uh, in our species, complexity has turned inward upon itself. And in our species, time has accelerated. Time has left the gentle ebb and flow of gene transfer and adaptation that characterizes biological evolution, and instead, historical time is generated. And so I believe that science and its reluctance to deal with the psychedelic experience and the way in which science has used then law to suppress its rival in this case arises out of a profound discomfort on the part of science about this future state of complexification that is clearly the uh, grail, the dwell point, the end point of the human historical process. No one of us, I think, can imagine that history could go on for another thousand years. I mean, what would it look like at the current rate of population growth, spread of epidemic disease, rate of invention, connectivity, depletion of resources, the atmosphere? It is impossible to conceive of another thousand years of human history. History, then, is ending. History is a kind of gestation process. It's a kind of metamorphosis. It's an episode in the life of a species. If you think of the, the simple example of metamorphosis, that of caterpillar to butterfly, we all know that there is this intermediate resting stage where the caterpillar is, for all practical purposes, enzymatically dissolved and then re constituted as an entirely different kind of organism with different uh, physical structures, different eyes, different legs, a different way of breathing, with wings where no wings were before, with a different kind of feeding apparatus. This is what's happening to us. 
History is a process of metamorphosis. It's a pupation stage. It begins with naked monkeys, and it ends with a human-machine, planet-girdling interface capable of releasing the energies that light the stars. And it lasts about 15 or 20,000 years, and during that period, the entire process hangs in the balance. It's a period of high risk. It's like uh, what a butterfly is doing in a cocoon or what is happening to a child in the womb. It's a gestation process where one form of life is being changed into another. Well, this would all happen naturally and with a great deal of anxiety, I imagine, as history builds to its ever more climactic and horrifying crescendo, and we would all be ignorant or very baffled about what's going on were it not for the institution of psychedelic shamanism. Remember I said that what is dissolved are the, the crystalline structures of cultural assumption? Well, one of the strongest um, symmetries in our cultural crystal is the symmetry that gathers around the concept of past and future. The shaman actually rises into a domain where past and future are different areas on the same topological manifold. This is not a metaphor. It's what's really going on. If you think about shamanism in its classical guise for a moment, it is about um, predicting weather, predicting game movement, and curing disease. If you had a prescient or extraordinary understanding of the future, each one of us would be able to do these things. Predicting the weather, you just look into next week and there it is. Predicting the movement of games, same deal. Curing the sick actually involves very judicious choice of your patients with a pre-knowledge of who will get well and who will not get well. So it's as though the members of the culture are imprisoned in linear time and the shaman is not. And why not? Because the shaman has perturbed the uh, brain states sanctioned by the culture, sanctioned by its educational processes, its habits, its uh, attitudes. And into that vacuum created by the perturbation of these cultural values rushes the raw, un analyzed datum of reality. This is what Aldous Huxley called removing the reducing valve of consciousness. And suddenly, culture is seen to be a relative phenomena. The stockbroker, no different from the rainforest shaman, each somewhat similar to uh, the Trobrian Islander or the Eskimo. Culture is simply clothing upon the human experience. But the human organism, outside the confines of culture, in a direct relationship to nature, transcends time and space. This was a fact, I believe, that was known in prehistory and, in fact, was the source of Paleolithic values, which were not material, not linear, not surplus-oriented, not class-oriented, not power-oriented, but rather oriented toward a kind of egalitarian partnership in, a, in an environment of great material simplicity. And human beings lived like that for probably a half a million years with poetry, with dance, with mathematics, with magic, with story, with humor, but not with the paralyzing and toxic artifacts of the late evolving machine worshipping monotheistic linear phonetic alphabet tight ass straight culture that we are a part of. So now, 
at a kind of moment of great cultural challenge and dynamic for Western civilization, which has for a thousand years called all the shots and shoved itself down everybody's throat, whether they liked it or not. In the last hundred years, through the science of anthropology and ethnography and ethnomedicine and botany, the news has arrived that these quote-unquote primitive people are in fact master technicians of journeying into a world of the neurological imagination, a world we didn't even know exists. A world that is as distant to us as the world at the heart of the atom is from the rainforest fishermen. And because our own cultural values seem a little shoddy at this moment, those on the fringes of Western civilization have begun to seek alternatives, begun to look at uh, alternative religions, yoga, tantra, Buddhism, Zen, whatever, uh, alternative approaches to diet, vegetarianism, macrobiotics, so forth and so on, and alternative approaches to authentic experience, which means psychedelics. Uh, in the early stage of psychedelic involvement, everyone was sort of flying under the banner of uh, hands-on Freudianism or hands-on Jungianism. You know, we're going to see those archetypes. We're going to confront those sexual repressions. We're going to journey into those traumatic childhood memories. N now, it's understood, I think, that those metaphors were fairly inadequate and that actually we stand on the brink of an unexplored landscape of planetary size. The world of the high Paleolithic, which is a Gaian world, a world of feeling, not analytical intellectual constructs, but a world of empowered feeling, empathy, and intuitive understanding, an understanding that doesn't arise in a context of Greek logic, but in a context of animal knowing in the authentic mode of the body. So just to bring it all around here, the great exhibit which we must always keep in front of ourselves and our critics is the mystery of the human mind and body. No one knows how it is that I can command my hand to make a fist and that it will do that. I mean, that's mind over matter. That's the violation of every scientific principle in the books. And yet it is the most trivial experience any of us have. We expect to command our body. We expect the mental will to order the monkey flesh into action and it will follow. The body is the nexus of the mystery of life. And our culture takes us out of the body and sells our loyalty into political systems, into religions, into inanimate objects and machines, collections, so forth and so on. Uh, the felt experience of the body is what the psychedelics are handing back to us. That's why it's called escape, because it's escape from HBO, from walking the mall, from seeing what's on the tube, from consuming trash media. It's escape from all of that into the authenticity of the body. This is why sexuality is so mm, edgy in this society. They'd make it illegal if they but could figure out how. It's, it's the one drug they can't tear from our grip, and so they lay a guilt trip about it. But sexuality and psychedelics, by carrying us back to an authentic sense of the body, carry us back to the domain of authentic values. And more and more the message that people are getting as they avail themselves of the psychedelic experience is that it is not a journey 
into the human unconscious or into the ghost bardos of our chaotic civilization. It's a journey into the presence of the Gaian mind that the earth is a coherent whole. It is a thinking, feeling, intending being that in terms of our value structures, it would be foolish to image as anything other than female. And when cultural values created by male dominance and science and linearity and so forth and so on, when those values are dissolved, what is waiting there is this incredibly poignant experience of matrix, what James Joyce called the mama matrix most mysterious. Nothing more than our bodies and the earth out of which our bodies came. History, as we have lived it in the West, has been a turning of our back on that. And now history has failed. Western cultural institutions, having become global cultural institutions, now show themselves to be adequate to inspire, lead, or carry anyone into a future worth living in. At this moment, then, this reconnecting to the Gaian mind becomes a kind of moral imperative. So this whole drug issue is not an issue even about criminal syndicates or about untaxed billions or about the mental health of our youth or any of that malarkey. I mean, my God, the most destructive drugs known to the species are peddled on every street corner without restriction. The real issue is what kind of mental worlds shall people inhabit? What kinds of hope shall be permitted? What kind of value systems shall be allowed? And the value systems that aggregate the possession of things, the tearing up of the earth, competition, classism, racism, sexism have led us to the brink of catastrophe. Now, I think we have to abandon cultural, Western cultural values and return to the deeper wisdom of the body in connection with the plants. That's the seamless web that leads us back into the heart of nature. And if we can do this, then this very narrow neck of cultural crisis can be navigated. Very little of the past can be saved. Uh, the architectonics, the machines, the systems of monetary exchange and propaganda, the silly religions, the asinine aesthetic canons, very little of that can be saved. But what can be saved is the sense of love and caring and mutuality that we all uh, put into and take from the human enterprise. You know, there's a Grateful Dead song that says, you can't go back and you can't stand still. If the thunder don't get you, then the lightning will. And we now hold, through the possession of these psychedelics, catalysts for the human imagination of sufficient power that if we use them, we can deconstruct the lethal vehicle that is carrying us toward the brink of apocalypse. We can deconstruct that vehicle and redesign it into a kind of starship that would carry us and our children out into the broad starry galaxy we know to be waiting us. But it's a cultural test. Nature is pitiless. Intelligence is a grand experiment upon which a great deal has been risked. But if it proves inadequate, nature will cover it over with the same kind of cool impunity that she covered over the dinosaurs and the trilobites and the crossopterygian fishes and all those other folks who came before. So what we must do, I think, is see our future in the imagination, catalyze the imagination, form symbiotic relationships with the plants, affirm archaic values, and spread the good news that what is out of control, what is in fact dying, is a world that had become 
become too top-heavy with its own hubris, too bent by its own false value systems, and too dehumanized to care about what happened to its own children. So I say, good riddance to it. Bring on the archaic revival, and let's create a new world. And that's it. And...